recording of the session is just started. So we will have this class uh, lecture recorded. Welcome everyone. Thank you for connecting. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> so let's um, pray and we get started with a, we're just praying together. Um, let's see. Would uh, who'd like to pray and open up today? Somebody just say I want to pray for uh, us as a class, and we get started. Brother Collins, would you like to pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful morning and uh, any time zone anybody who is on this call is on. So Lord, as we're going to start our class of faith, Lord, we call upon the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. who was left for us. You know, when Jesus Christ was going, he said that he won't leave us as orphans, but he will send for us a comforter. So Lord, mm -hmm. we are calling upon the, the, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding and the spirit of wisdom to help us through. Let our pastor be used as a vessel to teach us, but don't command us. Lord, we want your will to be done, just as your son said. Father, when he came in, when he, he came into the house, he told them, let peace be upon them. So, Lord, we call upon the peace to be upon each and everybody of us and all those friends of ours who are not yet connected to be connected in his own will and grace we do pray in the name of the father the son the holy spirit and everybody says amen amen, amen. thank you thank you collins appreciate it good morning welcome. and uh, welcome everyone thank you for uh, connecting to the class right so we'll uh, do a quick review uh, and um, we will move forward today we have two lectures uh, wonderful to spend time with god with god in his word and also sorry and also learn together all right let me just go back um let's just quickly review last class we um in chapter three we just uh, started looking at uh, the ministry of jesus how jesus in his earthly ministry engaged with people around this matter of faith. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He's the beginner and the perfecter of our faith. And so uh, what we're doing in chapter three and also in our next chapter, chapter four, is we're gonna just look at Jesus and learn from him on the subject of faith. So in chapter three, we are looking at his ministry. We are looking at uh, how did he engage with people. And what we said is, you know, uh, Jesus is the best person to learn from because he is the author and finisher of our faith. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means uh, today he will say the same things to us as he did to people 2,000 years ago or any time uh, that we find recorded for us in Scripture. So quickly to review, we said that... Um, Jesus uh, recognized and responded to people, to faith in those who came to him. So when he saw that people came to him in faith, he responded to that. And we saw, uh, in all of these, we'll give a few examples. There are obviously much more uh, that we will find in the Gospels. Uh, secondly, Jesus inquired. He asked people, do you have faith? So to the blind men. He said, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And uh, so Jesus is interested in us, in knowing what's in our heart and in us, you know, expressing our faith. Uh, we, thirdly, we see that Jesus encouraged faith even in hopeless situations. When things went from bad to worse, he just said, just believe, just believe. So we saw the example of uh, Jairus where, you know, when things went really bad, as far as his situation was concerned, Jesus told them, don't be afraid, only believe. And that's what he would tell us, you know, when in our circumstances, in our situations, he would say the same thing, 
don't be afraid, only believe, okay? Then we also saw that uh, Jesus encouraged people to act their faith. It means if you believe, step out on it. Act in line with what you believe. That's what it means to act their faith. So an example, the 10 lepers, he said, go, show yourself to the priests. And it says here, as they went, as they went, they were cleansed. So they came to him for healing. You know, they cried out, have mercy on us. And he said, go, show yourself to the priest. The priest is the one who would uh, check them and certify that, uh, you know, they are well. So as they went, so obviously they had to act their faith. They had to start doing this. And as they moved, journeyed towards where the priests lived, the Bible says they received their healing, their cleansing. So like this, uh, there are you know many instances where Jesus encourages people to act their faith. And uh, as they acted their faith, miracles took place. So that's where we stopped last uh, week. So we're picking up in point number five, where um, we are just looking at uh, the ministry of Jesus and what did he teach people or how did he engage uh, in faith? So the fifth one is that Jesus demonstrated that faith could affect nature. Faith could affect nature, or we could say, you know, things in our realm, in this natural realm, faith affected things in this world, even inanimate things, natural elements. Example, Jesus calmed the storm. Now, we are all familiar with this because uh, all of us would have uh, read this in the Gospels, but Let's read it again. Could I request somebody to please read Luke chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. It's there in the PDF. Uh, could somebody read that for us, please? Luke 8, 22 to 25. Now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples. And he said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched it out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And the windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water, and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased, and there was calm. But he said to them, Where is your faith? Yeah. And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, Okay, thank you. So we know this situation or this scenario, this incident that happened. So Jesus, Jesus said, you know, we're going to the other side. Now he's, he was asleep, a storm came. So here's something completely unexpected. Not only is it unexpected, it is something really dangerous because it's, hey, it's getting the boat down. The boat is in the process of sinking. And obviously, it is something that has caused fear in the hearts of the disciples. Now, out of their fear, they go, wake him up. And they're saying, Master, wake. We, we are, you know, we're about to die. We're perishing. And then Jesus calms, he speaks. He rebukes the wind and the water. There was a calm. And then he turns around to his disciples and he says, where is your faith? Where is your faith? What does it mean? What does it imply? What, what is the implication of that question? He's telling, basically he's telling his disciples, look, I know things were bad, but what you needed to do is to be in faith and not in fear. It also implies that, hey, you could have done the same thing that I did with your faith. So this question, where is your faith? 
that Jesus is asking his disciples is not an unreasonable question. That means he's not asking this question just to tease them or taunt them or bully them or be mean to them. No, he would not do that. That means he's asking them a very legitimate question. He's asking them a question which is implying he expected them to act that way. He expected them to handle this situation in that manner. Where is your faith? So in that turbulent situation, two things. Stay in faith and do the same thing I did with your faith. That means you calm the storm with your faith. You speak to natural elements. You speak to things in the natural realm and expect them to obey you. So Jesus is demonstrating to them that things in our realm is subject to faith. Uh, another classic example is in Mark chapter 11, and we will be looking at that in greater detail. I'll just uh, mention it in passing here. Uh, we see in Mark chapter 11 that on a certain occasion, uh, Jesus stops by a fig tree and he cursed the fig tree because he didn't find any fruit on it. He said, okay, uh, there will be there will no, uh, no more fruit will grow on you. Henceforth, he spoke to it. He cursed it. And the next day, as they passed by the same road, uh, they saw the fig tree. It was gone. It was withered. And uh, in that situation, Jesus teaches his disciples about having faith in God. So once again, we see that uh, uh, faith affected the realm of uh, the natural realm the realm of nature, natural elements, whether it was storms, whether it was a wind, whether it was a tree, whether it was sickness. There was times they would, you know, in the Gospels, we see Jesus speaking to sickness, telling it to leave. He's speaking to things in our natural realm. So Jesus demonstrated that, that faith affects things in the natural realm. The sixth one is that uh, we also see Jesus accommodating people outside of God's agenda in response to faith. Uh, what do we mean by that? Uh, we mean that during his earthly ministry, uh, Jesus came primarily to minister to the Jews, the Jewish people. And that was the that was God's agenda. That was the plan of God, that he would be sent there to the Jews, the messenger, the servant of God. But when non-Jewish people came, he accommodated them. We have examples here of the Roman centurion. He was not a, not a Jew, but you know, Jesus ministered to him or to his need. There was a woman of Canaan who came. And Jesus ministered to her need. And it's quite possible there may have been many more non-Jewish people who came like that in faith and he accommodated them. So it's telling us something about faith, that uh, faith to, to some extent, I'm not saying, you know, uh, Jesus went and you know, obviously he didn't go out and preach to all the Gentiles during the three and, a half, three and a half years of his earthly ministry. But when Gentiles came in faith, they were able to receive something that God had planned for them in the next phase, so to speak. That, uh, you know, after Christ would die and be raised up and ascend to heaven, the gospel would definitely go out to the, all, all the nations. It will be made available to everyone. But that was the next part of God's program. But faith pulled into the now what was still out, kept in the future. And so to some extent, we, do, we are able to do that by faith. I'm not saying everything, but God allows us to receive in advance some of the things um, through faith. And so we see even examples of that in the Old Testament. And uh, so I just want to 
place that before us and that we are able, that God allows us to do that by faith. Number seven, Jesus helped people when they struggled in faith. So, you know, we have a records in the gospels that uh, there were people who came and who were, came to Jesus and who were struggling in their faith. Just like us today, that there will be times when we ourselves struggle with our faith. But what do we see Jesus doing? He helped those who struggled in faith. Uh, some examples, uh, there's this man in Mark 9 who came to Jesus on behalf of his son who was demon possessed. And uh, you know what happened, uh, that first he brought his son to the disciples of Jesus. Jesus and three of his disciples were away. So there were nine others left. And now nine of his disciples could not help this boy who at that time was demon possessed. So surely the father must have been shaken in his faith. He said, well, I brought, you know, I brought my son to the disciples of Jesus. Nine of them are here and uh, they couldn't help my son. Shortly after that, Jesus comes with three of the other disciples and, uh, and this man cries out. He says, you know, he, he is my son, Lord help me. And uh, Jesus tells him. Uh, uh, Jesus asks of him, you know, how long uh, has this happened? And then he tells him, you know, uh, um, if you can believe, and actually this man says, you know, uh, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So Jesus, Jesus tells him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. I'm just trying to think, I was trying to recall the sequence. Yeah, so this man cries out and he says, Lord, if you can do anything, please help me. So that's his cry. Now that's because he has just gone through something that's really shaken his faith. You know, nine of the disciples of Jesus were there and they couldn't help his son. So now he's, you know, he's must have been quite shaken as far as his faith is concerned. And so he says, Lord, if you can do anything, please help me. So he's not in that place of absolute confidence that, that something is going to happen. He's not in that place of uh, in absolute belief in, uh, in Jesus. So he says, Lord, if you can believe, help me. And then Jesus turns it back to him and says, uh, you know, he tells him, he says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. So Jesus says, look, if you can believe, everything's possible. Then he admits, he says, Lord, I believe, help man believe. That means, he says, Lord, I, I believe. But he admits that he's struggling with some unbelief there when, because of what has just happened. And what, what, what do we see Jesus do? He goes ahead and he helps this man and delivers this child. So we don't find Jesus abandoning him and saying, you know, sorry, I can't help you. You've got some unbelief. He helps him anyway. Same thing, you know, we see in the case of Peter as he got out of the boat. You know, you know the story of this incident when Peter calls out to Jesus. He sees Jesus walking on the water. He says, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus says, come. And so Peter gets out of the boat and he starts walking on the water to Jesus. And he sees the waves. He sees all of that. He gets scared. Uh, and he was afraid, the Bible says. So Peter, fear comes into his mind because of all that's happening. And he starts sinking. And he cries out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reaches out, helps him. And of course, he admonishes him. He says, you know, why were you of little faith? I mean, your faith decreased. You started out in great faith. You started out in good faith, but your faith decreased. And why did you doubt? You know, why did you? Uh, of course, he saw the winds. He saw the waves. Uh, he saw all of that, and he let fear come in. And when fear comes in, faith has to leave. Or faith decreases, doubt comes in. So he says, why did you doubt? But Jesus helped them. They went back walking on the water. 
to the boat. So even today, you know, uh, it's, it's when we struggle in faith in certain situations, it's okay to tell them, Lord, you know, I'm struggling. Help me. And we can be sure that he's going to help us uh, get out of that place of fear, of doubt, and uh, uh, see us through. Uh, number eight, uh, I will, I'll finish these points and then we'll take questions. Um, number eight, there were times when Jesus healed and worked miracles independent of people's faith. So the norm was he expected people to come to him in faith. He saw their faith. Sometimes he asked them, asked them about their faith. Sometimes he told them to act their faith. But there, were, there are cases where Jesus worked miracles regardless of the individual's faith. And we, saw, we see some examples recorded for us. Uh, in John chapter 5, verses 1 to 9, there is this man by the pool of Bethesda. You know, and uh, this man didn't even know who Jesus was. He's been there for 38 years, the scripture says there. Uh, and um, he's been there a long time by the pool. And uh, He's waiting for the water to be stirred so he could jump in. And so Jesus comes to him and says, would you like to be made well? So imagine a stranger coming up and asking you, would you like to be made well? And uh, now this man doesn't recognize Jesus. He doesn't know who Jesus is. And he just says, Lord, uh, I don't have anybody to help me into the water. And Jesus says, rise, take up your bed and walk. That means there is a release of supernatural power. This man is healed and he's able to rise up and take, a, take up his bed and walk. Now, it is very clear in John chapter 5, Jesus explains why he did that miracle. He says, I do what I see the Father do. So that healing was something that the Father directed him to do it. Even though that man didn't have faith, he didn't even know who Jesus was. I so obviously didn't have any belief or faith, but Jesus still healed him because the Father directed. So here we're seeing the sovereignty of God at work. This is a sovereign work of God, independent of the individual's faith. So this is what we would refer to as an exception, that God does work sovereignly, but those are exceptions. The norm is people came to him in faith in great numbers and he ministered to them. So we find other, another example of this man who was born blind. This man too had no idea who Jesus was and Jesus healed him. Another example of uh, the widow woman's son in, in the city of Nain. There again, there is no indication that the woman came to Jesus. She was actually on her way to do the funeral, but Jesus intercepted the funeral pro pro procession and raises her son back to life. So we see that God would work in such manner even today uh, as an exception, but he's sovereign. A um, few more things. Number nine, people came in faith on behalf of others and received for them. So, there are examples where people come to Jesus in faith, but they came for somebody else, not for their own, but for, for themselves, but for somebody else. And here again, we have the same examples of uh, the Roman centurion. He came to Jesus on behalf of one of his servants or employees. There's the woman from Canaan who came to Jesus on behalf of her daughter. And uh, there's this nobleman, the father, who came on behalf of his son. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us whether the Roman centurion servant also believed. So, you know, uh, anything we say in that regard would just be a guess. Now, you know, we could guess that maybe he did believe or maybe he didn't. 
Same thing we don't know about the woman from Canaan, whether her daughter was somebody who had faith or did not have faith. We don't know. So regardless of whether they had faith or not, we don't know. But these people, they came in faith and received for someone they cared about. They received in faith. In faith they received for them. And uh, just, I think, two more thoughts here. Um, number 10, Jesus rebuked his disciples for being of little faith. And we, as we saw, when uh, Jesus noticed his disciples stepping away from a place of believing to a place of fear, doubt, unbelief. He rebuked them. He corrected them. Teaching us that, hey, stay in a place of faith. Don't let situations dictate your faith. And as you see, as we saw here, there was this time, time in the middle of the storm. Jesus tells them, why are you fearful? Where are you of little faith? So he rebukes them. So why are you being so afraid? Same thing with Peter. Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Uh, another time there were uh, the disciples uh, who were wondering, you know, how, how, how is he going to get bread to feed the people? He tells them, oh, you have little faith. Why are you wondering where are you going to get bread? Or, you know, where are you going to get this bread to feed the people? Another time when the disciples could not cast the demon out, he rebuked them. Oh, faithless. Faithless and perverse generation. Now, of course, he's speaking to the generation in, 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 in a broader sense, but there's also a rebuke to his own disciples because they did not do what he had commissioned them to do. So we can take that as a message for us as well, that Jesus would correct us and encourage us to move from a place of little faith or fear or doubt or being faithless and say, come on, come on, come on, come into this place of faith. Come into this place where you believe. So he would do the same for us. And lastly, we see that unbelief limited Jesus from doing mighty works. Both uh, uh, Matthew and Mark record this in their Gospels, that um, when Jesus went back to his own hometown of Nazareth, sorry, uh, it says he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief in his own hometown. Mark puts it like this. Mark says he marveled, he was surprised, he marveled because of their unbelief. So in his own hometown, he could not do many mighty works. And it was because of their unbelief. So unbelief, therefore, it actually, if you want to use the term, it ties the hands of God or it prevents God from working in our lives, in our situation. So little faith means, you know, I'm just weakening in my faith. But unbelief is, I don't believe he can do this. Now, we all struggle with faith. That's different. And that's where we say, Lord, help us. But unbelief is something we keep out of our lives because that means that just completely shuts the door on God from working in our lives. And remember, this was in his own hometown. I mean, these are people who knew him, knew his family. They saw him grow up. And perhaps it was because of that they were in unbelief because they just couldn't accept the fact that this young man, whom they saw grow up in the, amongst them, 
is now preaching and is now healing, is now delivering people and he's working miracles. And he says, but we know this man. We know this young man. He grew up here. He was just an ordinary person. How could he suddenly do all these things? And it, perhaps all of those kinds of reasoning, all of those kinds of thinking became a barrier to them, preventing them from having faith. And so we got to be careful of those barriers, the things that keep us from having faith. Right. So these 11 statements kind of summarize some of the things we see in the ministry of Jesus and how he interacted with people on faith, around the subject of faith. What we will do in the next chapter is look specifically at the teachings of Jesus. What did Jesus teach concerning faith? Right. But I want to pause here and I want to just, uh, you know, take questions, um, discuss uh, if you have any thoughts. Uh, and so on, we will take them up and discuss them. All right, so I'm just looking at the chat right now. And uh, there's a question there from Divya. Luke 9, 20, 29, when you come to the house, some of them say, why could we not cast out? So he said, this guy and fasting. Why was Jesus telling the disciples so? So, so this is Mark 9, 28, 29. Yeah, so, yeah. So we look at this particular incident, which is recorded for us both in uh, Matthew chapter 17 and also in Mark chapter 9, where uh, Jesus, uh, and where this, this, this man has brought his demon possessed son to Jesus and uh, actually he brought him. To the disciples and they fail to cast him out and then jesus comes and delivers him and then the disciples you know they go privately said lord you know what happened you know because we have done this before but what happened in this case why couldn't we cast it out and uh, jesus tells them and i'm looking at matthew 17 verse 20 uh, mark 9 and 23 he says, yeah, you know, because of your unbelief. Because of your unbelief. And then he says, if you have faith, you can, as a grain of mustard seed, you will tell the mountain to move and it will move and nothing will be impossible to you. Matthew 17, 20. And then he says in verse 21, However, this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. So the root cause is unbelief. Prayer and fasting helps us deal with unbelief. So you notice that in this situation, when Jesus walked in, he himself did not pray and fast. That means it was. It is not prayer and fasting that brings deliverance, but it is faith. But if I'm struggling with unbelief, prayer and fasting helps move me into a place of faith, and I minister out of that place of faith. Right. So when Jesus came into the situation, he did not pray and fast; he just ministered directly. Disciples could not. Do it. Why? Because of unbelief. So what was the cure for unbelief? You get into that, pray and fast. You go before God. Get your heart right before, you know, just engage with God to be in a place of faith. And then we minister to faith to bring deliverance. Another cross-reference, uh, Galatians chapter 3, verses 3 and 5, uh, and Paul writes that, he says, he who ministers the spirit and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? The answer there is obviously he does it by the hearing of faith. So this is Galatians chapter 3, uh, verse 2 and 5. Galatians 3, verses 2 and 5. Uh, that so, so the point there is that when we minister the works of the spirit, miracles, we do it by faith. I hope that's clear. 
Uh, yes, Pastor. Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shani, your question, please. Oh, yeah, I think you already answered it in the last question, but I know last week you were saying that in order for, like, if I'm praying for somebody, that either both people have to believe in faith or either one. So if, it either, if neither one of them believe, then they won't get healed, right? And I was, that was my question, but that you answered. And also, too, an example you gave in terms of Jesus, where the people came to him, they didn't believe. Is that the example? They got healed because Jesus believed? So those were my questions. Yes. So the norm, like we have been sharing, is that both people should be in faith. The person who, who, wants to, who's, who needs to be prayed for and the person doing the ministry both have to be in faith. That's the norm. But there are exceptions, meaning that's where the sovereign work of God comes in. Uh, uh, sorry, let me just say, the norm is both people have to be in faith. Then there is the other situation where the person, person ministering is in faith. You know, the, 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 the person receiving may not be in faith. Yeah, like we saw the examples, the man by the pool of Bethesda or the blind man, they didn't even know who Jesus was. But the person, but Jesus ministering to them obviously was in faith. So the person ministering is in faith and they still receive. So those are those, that those miracles do happen. And those are, you would say, like exceptions, right? Because it's going away from the norm. The norm is everybody comes in faith, but there is also room for these exceptions where the person receiving may not be in faith, but the person ministering is in faith and God works miracles. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, anything else to discuss before we move forward? Okay. So, um, so what we did just now is we just looked at the ministry of Jesus, how he engaged with people around faith. Now, we're going to go to chapter four, and I've put out the PDF in the coursework, so you can take it from there. In chapter four, we're going to look specifically on the teachings of Jesus. What did he teach people? So that we're basically looking at what he spoke concerning faith. Because, and we are working on the same premise, that if Jesus was here today speaking to you and me, he would teach us the same thing because he hasn't changed. And, um, you know, times have changed. That means... Um, we are here 2,000 years since the earthly ministry of Jesus. We're here 2,000 years later. The times have changed. You know, we have a lot of we've made a lot of advancements in terms of uh, technology and standard of living and all those kinds of things. But the teachings of Jesus are timeless. He would tell us to do the same thing today. Uh, the situations that you and I face may not be exactly the same as in Bible times. There, they were, <clears throat> you know, they faced storms in the sea. Now, you and I may not face storms in the sea. You know, we may not be traveling by boat or so on. But we may face storms in life situations. There'll be turbulent things happening around us. But the same principle applies. Okay? So, we're going to Get into chapter four, I'll share the PDF. All right, <clears throat> Jesus teaching on faith, chapter four. Right? So what we're going to do is just look at what did Jesus teach people concerning faith. And um, we, I want to just lay the, Put this before us before we get into the, uh, the the statements of Jesus that 
there is truth and there are facts. Facts can change. Truth will never change. So what do we mean by that? So let's say, you know, uh, a person goes to the doctor and the doctor, you know, they do all the tests and they give the report. And the report says, you know, um, the report for this person says, okay, you have such and such a disease or such and such a condition. Now that is fact. We're not denying it. You know, the doctors are doing their job. They have run their tests and they, they've, you know, done all the diagnosis and to the best of their knowledge, uh, they are giving the report and the report says, uh, you have such and such a disease. That is a fact. We are not denying it. But that fact can change. The truth is, God said, I am the Lord, your healer. That is truth. That will never change. In sickness, out of sickness, God, is, God says the same thing. I am the Lord, your healer. The word of God is truth. The word of God says, by his stripes, you have been healed. That is truth. That will never change. In sickness, out of sickness, the word of God reads the same. So, this person who is sick, who's been given the doctor's report, yeah, they have faced the fact. There's some sickness in their body, some disease. The doctor says, this is what we've diagnosed. That's a fact. Now the person has a choice. To, they can believe God. They can have faith in God, in the truth of God, and change the fact. That means they can receive healing. The disease can leave their body and the fact changes. Yesterday, so they go back to the doctor. The doctor you know, runs the test again. And this time the report says, this, you're fine. So two reports, same person, facts have changed. Once, once the report said you were sick, now it's saying, you know, you're fine. The fact has changed. But the truth reads the same. By his stripes, you have been healed. So, we have the choice uh, to always believe the truth, right? And we don't need to m modify truth to accommodate facts or experiences. So, the wrong thing to do, if this person got a report from the doctor saying, you're sick, the wrong thing to do is, oh, God made me sick, or God is not my healer. No, 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 don't change the truth. The truth says, God says, I am the Lord, your healer. The truth says, by his stripes, you have been healed. That's the truth. That will never change. But the fact can change. Okay? So keep the two differences, uh, the differences between the two. Don't change the truth to accommodate the fact. Expect the fact to change, to align itself to the truth. So when you talk about fact, we're talking about experiences, life experiences, right? Now, let's get into the teachings of Jesus and, you know, we will see what did Jesus teach us about faith? So, first thing that you want to understand is Jesus said, all things are possible through faith. All things are possible. Now, we can look at some of the teachings in Matthew, and I've just you know put out some of the references here. In Matthew 17, 20. Can somebody read that for us, please? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Hmm. Now, these are the words of Jesus. These are not somebody, you know, some, somebody else's words. These are the words of Jesus himself. 
And Jesus said, if you have faith, if you have faith, nothing will be impossible to you. Now, we will look at the other part of the verse as well a little later. I'm just emphasizing this one part. He said, if you have faith, nothing, nothing will be impossible for you. He repeats that again in Mark 9.23, just puts it in a different way. He said, if you can believe, all things, all things are possible to him who believes. Now, this is the teaching of Jesus. So I'm emphasizing that, that you know, this, this is what he would teach us today. If, you know, he came to us to speak to all of us, he would say the same things. All things are possible to him who believes. So we must be of the same mind that when we go through life situations and, you know, we will face very difficult, you know, whatever we face in life, some situations may look impossible. Some things may seem impossible, you know, uh, for God to help us or God to do something there. But we must believe the words of Jesus. He said, nothing will be impossible to you. He said, all things are possible. So we are of the same mind. Lord, I know my situation looks bad. I know things look very difficult. Um, perhaps even humanly speaking, people would have said nothing can change. But you said, if we have faith, nothing will be impossible. You said, if we can believe, all things are possible. So I'm going to join with you. I'm going to agree with you, Jesus. That's what I'm going to do. Right? The other thing I just want to highlight here is, uh, uh, you know, when Jesus talks about the mustard seed, he says, if you have faith as a mustard seed, he's just showing us the power of faith. You know, think of a mustard seed and think of a mountain. Just think about it. A mustard seed, so tiny, so small. Think of the mountain, huge. But he says, Faith is so powerful. Faith is so effective that a small amount of faith in God can cause a big outcome, a big result. That's the point. Right? So uh, don't get so caught up with, you know, okay, is my my faith the size of a mustard seed or not? Don't worry about that. Just get the main message. So he's just giving us a comparison, right? He says he's using the word as, uh, so as usually in English would be, you'd say it's a simile, it's a, you know, it's just a comparison. So he's saying faith as small as a mustard seed can affect such a big thing in your life. That means faith is so powerful. It is so effective. It can do something um, uh, so great, right? Why is that possible? Because the power or the force behind the mustard seed size faith is God himself. God is working through our faith, or we could say, our faith gives God the opportunity to work in our lives. So even that little amount of faith we have, or you know, that, that faith that we have, it may look so small, but our faith in God is very powerful because it is God working through it. So don't worry about the size, you know, mustard seed, mountain. It's, not, it's just a comparison. So don't just forget about the size factor. But think about this. Faith gives God the opportunity 
to work through your life. And faith is powerful because God is working through our faith. And nothing, therefore, is impossible. Okay? We're going to pause here for now. We'll take a quick 10-minute break. And we'll be back. We'll continue looking at the teachings of Jesus concerning faith. We'll pick up here with point two. Okay? And we'll also take questions towards the end of the class. Okay, see you in 10 minutes. Thank you.